Normally we come on and we uh, hammer away at you for five minutes saying what you might want to ring in for, but we're fed up with doing that because we only get 55 minutes. 55 minutes. I'm Danny Baker. I'm Danny Kelly. This is Baker and Kelly up front. You are football supporters. We are all one o three four five nine o nine and 693. But before we do start this week, hang on, hang on. Hang on. Dear Vinnie Jones, on last week's show, you bet me... 100 English pounds that you would win. I said you would lose. If you want your 100 pounds, I'll meet you anywhere, any time, and take it out on your chin. You've got more chance of getting struck by lightning. I don't like you, and never have. There you go. Thank you very much. I just had to get that off down before we... There's a stamp. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah, lovely. That'll go off. All yeah. right. It's uh, coming up to ten to two. Let's take one more. Mark, where are you, Mark? In Ipswich. What happened to you, Mark? What's the story? Well, um, I've got an advert um, from a football magazine. Yeah. Okay. Have you ever wanted to surprise someone with a card by signed by their favourite football players? Now you can. For just ten pounds... The person of your choice will be sent both a birthday card and a Christmas card, each signed in person by at least three players from the club of your choice. Currently, we have the following clubs available. Darlington, Doncaster, <laughs> Hull, Mansfield, Notts County, oh, Oldham, man. Plymouth, Scunthorpe and Torquay. Oh, where have you found this, Mark? <laughs> shoot magazine. It's in Shoot, shoot magazine. Yeah. Shoot. I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, I reacted a little too much during that roll of honour again. So Let's have it again. Just in case anyone was on top of this service and, and, and missed it because we were laughing over that, that roll of honour. And I'll tell you what, this time, read them from the back. Start with the last one and go back to the top again. Off you go. Okay. Torquay, Scunthorpe, Plymouth, Oldham, Notts County, Mansfield, Hull... Doncaster and Darlington. They've signed those up. Like Michael Ovitz in Los Angeles, they've got them all under control <laughs> at the moment. And you can get actually a Christmas card or signed by three, three of the players. players. <laughs> I'm loving those nitwit footballers when they finally get... Say, what's this? You know, it's the scheme we're doing. Oh, right, what have I got to put? Just sign it. All right. It's uh, yep. no heart in it. Mark, so, do, do we have T-shirts? Do we send anything? If we had anything, Mark, we'd send it to you. We must send him something. We'll, uh, we'll send you this net or something. We'll send... Yeah, we'll send him a video. That's what we do. We say, uh, yeah, uh, what video could we send him? Oh, I know. All right, it's a uh, 10 to do. We'll do Andy Darling, 0345 909 693. You hear the kind of mania that's going on. The only way to guarantee getting on the air is to be any good. This week, Andy Darling, as we've established, was talking about... Uh, celebrity football Celebrity fans. footballers. It already started and we interrupted him, so here we go. <clears throat> There have always been celebrity football fans. Shortly after World War II, Peter Glaze, Jimmy Clitheroe and Charlie Caroli would regularly hire a Sharabank and go and see West Ham play. Jimmy and Peter always lived in dread that the Sharabank would break down, because then they'd have to go to the game in Charlie's clown car, which had square wheels and invariably exploded in a puff of purple smoke en route. Here's the official top five of celebrity fans of the last few decades. At five, it's Rackle Welsh. Rackle regularly attended Chelsea games in the early 70s. She often wore a handsome blue leather pant and was a particular fan of Marvin Hinton, Mickey Droy and Bobby Tambling. These days, Chelsea's main celeb fans are John Major, David Meller and Phil Collins. That's John Major, David Meller and Phil Collins. Rumour has it that Dennis Wise reached for the soap in the communal bath recently and found there was a single pubic hair sticking in it. Blimey, it's Phil Collins' head, he exclaimed. At four, it's Sean Bean, Sheffield United's number one fan. Even if United are losing at half-time, Sean is never downhearted. Like his character Mellors in Lady Chatterley's Lover, he believes they're good at coming from behind. At three, it's Delia Smith. As well as avidly supporting Norwich City, Delia also provides the team with snacks at half-time. Indeed, just the other week, off the record, Brian Gunn blamed his dreadful error, which let Ipswich in, on the fact that his half-time salad of curly on Dive and rockers, with a balsamic vinegar dressing, was lying a bit heavy on his stomach. At number two, it's June Whitfield, Wimbledon obsessive. The only thing that prevented June from being at number one is her occasional impunctuality on match days. Many is the time that she's arrived at games late, on account of her hapless husband's mishaps. 
Last week, for example, she opened the front door to leave the house, only for the door to knock over the ladder he'd unwisely placed in front of it. I couldn't just leave him hanging from the guttering, she later said. And at number one, it's former Take That Pin-Up Robbie Williams. Rather than claiming to follow a fashionable club, Robbie stands by his local childhood heroes, Port Vale. He's always to be found at home games, sometimes disguised, and usually accompanied by his great friend and fellow Vale fanatic, TV's Nick Hancock. Well done, Robbie. Darling, for this week, I'm glad he got around the June Whitfield there because yeah. every time women do anything, she's there. But how I don't know how many games actually June really does attend. Bung somebody yeah. else through, Gary. Where are you, Gary? Gary, it's, it, it's Danny. Is that Danny? Yes, yeah. it is. Both Hello, of mate. Yes. Yeah. Hey, uh, and, and by the way, in my in my clumsily written pre-program notes, how about this? Everyone, one and all, Danny Kelly got married yesterday. Well <laughs> yesterday, done, Danny. And he's Thank here you. doing the show. Well done, Danny. I like this show, Danny. I'm going to be on all the time. Seriously, where was it? His wedding reception last night. Well, and everyone we're there said, just oh, a few hours ago. A few hours ago. And he got married last night. I forgot to say this right at the top. He got married yesterday. He's here doing the show. And yeah, let me... More fool him, people uh, think, but no, that's No, fine. no, no. Hang on, let's sing this out. Uh, Jim and the Doc getting married yesterday would have been in. No. David Miller would have been No. Yeah, us two, no. We on next week, no. No, oh, no. That's, that's you too... work it out for yourselves. Figure it out. Danny Kelly got married yesterday. He's here now. Carry on, my friend. Okay, uh, bang someone else through. That'd be Dave. Dave, where are you? Hello, uh, is this me? Yeah, it would be you, Dave. Go on. Yeah, yep. no, you were on to Dave a minute ago. I'm oh, in no, the yeah. middle of nowhere. I've just been to try and go to the Thixton Brewery and have a drink, and the bloody thing was shut. A uh, brewery shut on Sunday, sir? I know, I know. Okay, Pro yeah. Routine maintenance. Um, okay. Well, I'll just run up because I don't know if this is anything you've been going on about today, but this is my claim to fame. Go on. Um, I used to work for Granada Television Rental years ago. Yeah. And I was sent to the Hawthorns. Yeah. Uh, to repossess the, the television from the dressing room. Whoa! <laughs> what do you mean? Is that something we might be interested in? <laughs> Are you mad, sir? <laughs> Give us right. every. Day. You were working for who? Get the typewriter ready. Yeah, no, yeah, 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 yeah. Here we go. Here we go. I get sued for this, can I? No, yeah. no. We're, 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 immunity. Absolute immunity on this show. Yeah, you are a TV rental. Yeah. Right, I, I was as a debt collector. Sure. And when people went a couple of months into debt, it used to punch it up on the computer. Hang on, hang on. And punch I, it up <laughs> on computer. Yeah, go on. And I used to have to go around and, and uh, ask him why they were in arrears and repossess. Unless you could get the money there and then, you took the telly with you, didn't I, leave. I, I, I'm afraid, uh, I'm ashamed to say it, but my own family background, that somehow is a page from the diary of. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, anyway, yeah, go on. I mean, quite a few things happened to me over the years, but, you know... But you went, to, you went to West Brom and did yeah. you take their telly? I did, yeah. Yes! <laughs> um, it was in the era of uh, Brian Robson and Cyril Reed, just in that, and they were all... It was about... Of course, you were watching the news. Yeah. And it was up on a up on a plinth above oh, in the change room, and they were all getting changed and, and watching the news. And I just had to go in and unplug it and take it away. And did anybody try and stop you or anything like no, that? No, 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 because I, I, I went and saw officials from the club. To be honest, right, I've got to be fair. There was, there was, no, 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 no
Ten years ago, approximately, we were working on Ash, which is the alternative strategic headquarters in um, High Wycombe. OK. Oh. Where they controlled the Gulf War. For. Yeah, but it sounds like you're coming from some underground... Either that or you're doing that thing with the tops well, and I'm glasses. Well, some other government building at the moment. Cool! But, it's actually a spy. Yes. Yeah, um, <laughs> Dave the spy, everyone. Right, yeah, go on. Uh, anyway, so, usual usual thing, but we, we, we you know, big room... Look, the usual sort of thing that this, it brought typical atomic headquarters. Yeah, it was bug standard atomic headquarters, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. So large open room, <laughs> a, a few computers down the side. So, being resourceful guys, sticky tape up the wall to make the gold. <laughs> Uh, this, this, of course, uh, you know, leaves the world's future yeah. in absolutely safe hands, yeah? Yeah, yeah, but we're Dave, well, we don't go on about that anyway. But, yeah. um, then, um, so... You, you taped a goal up on the wall, did you? Yeah, Good you know, fan. George, you know, the old brown tape. The yeah, box, yeah, of course, yeah. Tape. Um, the ball was made out of the industrial cling film. Oh, yes, of course, yeah. I should imagine you should actually get a, a, roll, roll that up. a good no. weight on that, yeah. Yeah, good, it, it, goes, it goes well. <laughs> anyway, it hit it that was... silly red button over in the corner, nobody no, knows no, what's no, for no, you. No, no, well, that was in the room next door. But, uh, <laughs> Keys in, when turn, turn squash, out yeah. again, yeah, OK, yeah. We, no, we made sure that all the video cameras had been disconnected. <laughs> well, sure, just, you know, if the Russians attack, yeah. let them attack, we'll have a game going We're here, We're trying yeah. to play football, sorry. Yeah, come on, come on, let's. Yeah. The, the data and communications guys versus the electricians. Yeah. It was, it was all going well, no. Know, it was about it was just about Christmas time. And, you know, we'd all we'd had a few. Yeah. We were, we were not going to do any more work that day, so we we're playing away. And all of a sudden, the door opens. Yeah. And there he is, five stars on his shoulder. Oh man. In his hat, and this he was, you know, some some yank general. I don't yeah. know what it was. But uh, actually, you know, it was as you said, like the comedy film. It all went boom. Very we very all quiet. This guy. Then the door shut again. And we carried on playing. He did. He didn't notice. He didn't. He, no. he pretended not to see it. Oh no, he saw it. But um, I, in, I think he had a giggling tiller girl no, behind so him. No, it was just one of those things. You know, he he, he was. He could have, no, Seriously, Dave, I, 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 I think he had a tiller girl behind him or some kind of nightclub dance. He said, tell you what, my dear, I know where we can go and be well, alone. So we opened the door thing, to... Oops. That sort of thing went on underneath the full floors. Oh, this is... This is yeah, we're now we're learning all about fence secrets. Radio 5 Live here. I know they do their, their colour pieces and their Chinese New Year pieces and you can they, they'll tell you about what's happening. But these are the kind of stories yeah. all human life is here. And to hell with the official secrets. Yeah, Dave, uh, uh, who won the game? Or was this a regular occurrence? <laughs> Breaking up! We need assistance, she's, Mayday, Mayday. We're going, going down here. He's going. I'm, I'm going. going. I suggest the older colonel could have brought this out of his pocket. Ah! <laughs> and brought proceedings to a, something. That's just so he's in the atomic uh, bomb centre, if that's not yeah, too old-fashioned yeah. a phrase. They've had a few. Uh, they disconnected all the security cameras. <laughs> <laughs> they're just having a game. But and the Americans arrive, late as usual, and he, uh... Wow. Well, and it's, uh, it's, it's, and, uh, it's, it's a magic he, morning, he, he's, everyone. He's added to the bread roll apple big metal nut with the industrial cellophane. These are all improvised ball games in unusual places we need to know about. I believe it's Red Gutteridge. It has got, got a cork leg. It's got a cork leg, sir. Uh, the boxing commentator at Red Gutteridge has a cork leg, a leg made of cork. OK, and, and, uh, and at boxing dinners, he sits amongst grizzled old heavyweights. And You've heard this, right? Oh, I, I told you, actually. <laughs> did you? No, I don't think no, you did. I no, for you. I've worked with Red. Red table. Probably, yes. table with, with Muhammad Ali, Joe Fraser and George Foreman. Yes, and, and what happens? They were all discussing how hard they were and the yeah. ghetto man and all the rest yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah, and this was going on all night and the, the drinks got stickier and stickier and darker and darker. It's like, and of course, we had no shoes and we lived on gravel. And he said, yeah. I'll show you hard. And he got on those big silver forks and he stuck it straight into his thigh with a <laughs> boing noise. And they all went, ah, them English, they hard. Okay. Andy Darling now, and he's doing on Club Chairman. OK, before we do, give out give the fax number and the other the thing. The fax number is 0171 765 5909. That's 0171 765 5909. Call us 0345 909 693. Here's Andy Darling. In the good old days, when men on the terraces would wee in each other's pockets rather than barge their way to the fetid toilet facilities, and thus miss a bit of razzle-dazzle from Charlie Mitten, Wilf Mannion or wee Huey Gallagher, football club chairmen were a shadowy breed. They were easily recognisable though, and the archetypes persisted until the late 80s. They were local men, generally in their 60s, who'd made a bit of brass. They were old fellows with bloodshot eyes, who hit the source to some tune come match day. Butchery was a favourite trade. Referees who let 50-50 decisions go their side's way would often find a brown paper bag in the changing room afterwards, stuffed with blood sausages and a nice shank of mutton. The motor trade was another favourite line of work. 
chairman would often have a showroom near to the ground, full of second-hand jags, which they'd occasionally loan to star players. You knew who your team's chairman was, but unless he happened to be Bob Lord or Ernie Clay, you rarely saw or heard much of them, and you certainly were never told how much they were worth, nor how much cash they pumped into the club. And then along came Michael Knighton. He it was who claimed he was taking over at Manchester United, and to prove it, he played keepy uppy on his head in front of a full house at Old Trafford. It didn't quite work out for Knighton, as we know, but the floodgates were opened. There was the 19-year-old laddie who claimed he was buying Aldershot, though it soon turned out that he couldn't even afford a nail to hang his arse on. There are, though, plenty of bona fide, rich and youngish chairmen now. Matthew Harding, he made his money from insurance. Alan Sugar, he made a packet selling computers. These are modern men, thriving in the high-tech modern world, a far cry from the tripe sellers of yore. Or are they? John Medechsky, top man at Reading, worth £165 million, is a publisher of Auto Trader magazine. In other words, when all's said and done, he's a used car salesman. Ross Warburton, big man at Bolton, has made £65 million from the catering industry. The man's actually a baker. Steve Gibson at Middlesbrough is in chemical transportation. That's long-distance lorry driving to me and thee. They may be younger, have more money and fancier job titles, but these fellas are basically the same as the old breed. As the French would have it, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. There is one difference, though. Business really is everything these days. Rumours are afoot that those struggling giants, Manchester City and Birmingham City, might be merging in a big business deal. After all, Birmingham's owners, David and Ralph Gold, publish mucky books, whilst Manchester City's chairman, Francis Lee, manufactures toilet paper and tissue. Hey, work it out. any during that. If you've got a chairman, of course, who runs an ignoble business in your eyes, yep. you can't wait, uh, uh, man, you can't wait yeah. Francis Lee's business, yeah. notoriously the toilet paper business, even though yep. it's probably a little more refined than that. But if your chairman uh, has a humiliating business concern, <laughs> we certainly want to hear from you Any level, that. we just want to hear. Uh, that, that's Ian. What letters yes. have you marked out? Oh, I haven't done that for ages. Many letters. I'll Wait there, Lance and Brian and Andy and right. Yetzin and This et letter, for those of you who listen to the BBC and believe that the world is as it was in the 50s in black and white films, should switch off their radio now. But this is a great story about about attempting to bribe someone to throw a match. Mm -hmm. um, and it comes, and of course, the, the very thing that you know uh, that you're going to have to plump up a cushion, it comes from Her Majesty's Prison in Lincoln. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, from prisoner, uh, I'll read out his number, he's put it on here, I assume he wants me to, to get his, his prison and sentence extended, uh -huh. RJ2835, hello to you, uh, blah, 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 blah. About throwing a football match, last week's show, I must tell you this, Lincoln Prison FC were playing a local team and I was the goalkeeper. Um, he's playing in goal. We're playing against an ordinary team of outside people, as he puts it here, and the pre-match gets together, we're allowed to mix with the opposing players, and I was approached by their manager, offering me what he describes here as an ounce of cannabis to yeah. throw the game. Yeah. Um, it, was an, it was an important top of the table clash. I took the dope, he says, I passed it on to a con on the touchline, my mate, then I played a blinder and we won 3-1. We were all driven straight back to the prison, <laughs> with the stuff, had a great party, and the manager of the other team could not say a That's single a thing about it. That has got to come on the dumbest deal <laughs> in the history of the world. Yeah, and there's a very nice picture of a man smoking at the bottom of this. <laughs> <Is> there is. <laughs> I'm 40, yeah, but I'm not celebrating anything yeah. about this other than no. the liberty involved. It yeah. could have been why uh, two two balls of wool. Yeah. It just happens to have been uh, an ounce of cannabis. <laughs> what an idiot. Uh, <laughs> listen here, other prisoner. Uh, <laughs> you look like the kind of guy who does a, deals a straight deal. I, I, think, I think he was a bit dishonest, this goalkeeper, wasn't he? Wow, I didn't think. Well, it's 3-1 and went straight back. <laughs> yeah. He has done a little illustration down in the corner. Excellent call. Well, uh, I'll give it some of this. Uh, yeah, let's give it some of this. very good. What do you want to tell us, John? Well, I think uh, I've been listening to your programme since it started. And I oh, think, cool. I think this is uh, a first. Um, I need to take it back to 1970. Yeah. Um, from Belfast, troubles were very, very bad. Mm -hmm. um, now, the Sunday league games that you play in and around in um, London, they happen here on a Saturday. Saturday, um, okay. Yeah, the amateur teams play on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. Well, I used to follow a team when I was um, 10 or 11. Yeah. And they turned up at a, to play a, a match on a Saturday. It was absolutely lashing down rain. It yeah. was an all-weather pitch. But the referee, uh, because it was so bad, the weather was so bad, he went home. The referee he went, went home? He went home. All the other pitches, <laughs> all, <laughs> that's how bad it was on an all-weather pitch. Yeah. Right? Um, 
all the other pitches, uh, all the other teams went home and referees went home, but the two teams that I had come to see decided that they wanted to play. That's it, that's the way forward, yeah. Don't all stop. right, well, however, two teams, 11 aside, that's all there were there. Mm. Nobody else was seen. I didn't even see a car passing during the match, and they asked me to referee it. Oh, yeah, yeah. 11-year-old. Yeah. So they handed me a whistle. An 11, that's a fir- that is a first yeah. already. An 11-year-old referee. Oh. There has been no younger referee, sir, than you. I know, I So what happened was they planted me on the halfway line. Mm-hmm. And I blew the whistle. I had a duffel coat on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Per corduroy trousers. Yeah. Bell bottoms or flare bottoms, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call them. Mm-hmm. And I just stood there for 45 minutes. I didn't move because it couldn't move. You in, in the centre circle? No, in the, and the, they, they put me to the, on the, cent, the, the line, and the halfway line on the side of the pitch. On the side, right, just yeah. like you're watching, in fact. Yes, yeah. and just planted me there. But and you I, had an honorary title of, uh, you know, uh, uh, of referee. Right, rather I mean, like, you know, oh, Jeffrey Howell. Well, they, 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 they turned around and the opposition team says, well, we'll let your supporter referee it. I was the only supporter. The only one there? Yeah. And in, in in, in the ref- referee had gone home too. Team. Now, of course, you must have made some decisions, surely. Right. Okay, but what I was saying, I didn't move at all because yeah. I couldn't move with the rain. So I just stood with my hands in my pockets and yeah. the hood up and the whistle in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Did, yeah. So I, I blew the whistle every time I made a decision but didn't move. And it was going along fine. But then um, I remember uh, there was a dodgy decision and the team that I was supporting uh, scored a goal and I, of course, give it. Mm. But all the other team charged over around me. Uh, yeah. There's an 11-year-old boy with a duffel coat and a whistle in his mouth, yeah. yeah. And they started uh, shouting. And it was a Saturday and you know what they're like after uh, a Friday night. And they yeah. Hadn't, they yeah. hadn't shaved and there was full cream running down their head. And sure. The, the smell and they were shouting a bad decision, whatever. But anyway, I said, I give it anyway. <laughs> and it ended up, then at half time, they totally ignored me. Yeah. The two teams. Then oh, it's turned around. Ignored- <laughs> <laughs> It's a thankless job, isn't it? It's a thankless job. They, they turned around and they started to play um, another game. I started to play the second half. Yeah. But and again, I think the team, if I remember rightly, the team that I was with, they won two 0 obviously. Yeah. But then when I blew the whistle, um, I was about ten or fifteen minutes early because I couldn't take my hand out of my pocket to see the watch. <laughs> <laughs> right. They, I blew the whistle. They all went into their cars and forgot about me. Oh, oh wow. And they left you there? No, no, but then someone remembered. But I couldn't walk because of the rain and the wind. I couldn't walk. So yeah, but I, can't, I can't understand why. Why can't you walk? Because the, the, the clothes are so had, heavy, yeah? The rain had just soaked absolutely through me. I couldn't bend my knees. Yeah, but he's an 11 year old kid and he's stuck on the side. I remember now he's telling it with a light laugh in his voice. Yeah. Then he's 11 uh-huh. and he's got all these heroes because he's followed this time. Yeah. He's, yeah. Got, he's, he's got a wish in his mouth. He's terrified. He's got his hands in his pockets. Uh-huh. It's 1970. And of course he's not going to go. He said, because if he moves, he'll go, where are you going? No. Uh, and then he's too polite to say, hello, how about me? I can understand. I was that 11-year-old kid. I can understand that. But yeah. somebody, somebody came out of the car and remembered oh, and, and scooped me up, literally scooped me up and carried me across <laughs> horizontally. You know? that, every referee should have to go through this. <laughs> and they laid me in the back of a car and that's the way I went home. They laid you in the back of a the car? They laid me in the back of a car because I couldn't sit up. I couldn't dance. My this was so, I, don't remember, I don't remember the great iron rain of 1917. <laughs> you know, I went to every rock festival yeah, between 69 and 73. The joint stiffening rain of 1970. <laughs> you weren't standing there for an hour and a half. No, I suppose it? not. It was cold too, was it? Yeah. It was cold. What was the name of the team you followed? The team that I followed were called St Malachy. Uh-huh. And they were a minor league team. They actually won the league. Uh, and and uh, you, obviously you, you carried on following them. You were you well, honoured to do it, was you? I, well, like, after about, uh, say, two or three years, you know, I got a bit older and you decided to play football yourself. Yeah. Or go away well. well said, but, um, yeah. It's great already. Well, uh, that, 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 uh, you know, that for, uh, for absolute intrigue and wolf and weave, that was going towards the cardboard, but the uh, plywood bow tie. That it's uh, a, it's a long, 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 lovely, but very, very beautiful. And an eleven-year-old referee. Can we beat that now? Now, as we keep whinging on, they keep disappearing this show while others go ploughing on with their dull Next week old again, next, and next week we're not on again. I can't apologise enough. It really has nothing to do with us, and it will be sorted out, possibly by going to talk. Anyway, <laughs> but uh, at 27 after 2 o'clock, write to us in the meantime. Keep our spirits afloat and write to us with stuff yep. like that, because you won't get this outlet anywhere. All the letters get read. I mean, that's, that's a total guarantee. OK, uh, Keith, where are you, Keith? I'm um, in Brentwood, mate. What do you want to say, my friend? Um, just really going back to um, bits that... Uh, Footballers have said to you like over the years and, and rucking off their own clubs. Okay, this is actual indiscreet things that uh, you know for a fact we can't disagree with you because you know you heard it from the footballers themselves. They think they're off duty. You talk to him, you think, oh, we should say some of that on the telly usually. What did they say? Well, I used to do the um, Christmas dinner for uh, West Ham Club. Yeah. And uh, I had uh, 
during 8081 um, at Christmas, I had uh, Frankie Lampard, Patsy Holland, uh, all France. the chaps, all the chaps, yeah, yeah, Francois van der Elst and all that. Of course. Um, oh, 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 and now listening to this, going, oh no, what did we say? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and and they were saying that they wouldn't do nothing that season. Um, they go down. They had no <laughs> chance in the cups, etc. And they ended up being in the in the cup with, um, I think it was Tottenham, wasn't it? They, they didn't go down though. No, they didn't well, go down. See, see, no, well, that, that must be the year they played Fulham in the final. See, all, yeah, all this is fair well, comment because uh, see, football is never... This is the only way you'll get the truth from hearing calls on this show like this. Because as we know, footballers are real human beings. They're real blokes. Uh, they're slightly more cynical than football supporters, certainly. But they know when they're no good. But you'll never hear it said unless we get the reports through on this show. So that was West Ham's own team saying they were no good. Yeah, um, and uh, also, just as a little anecdote, on yeah. that particular uh, day, um, Patsy Holland turned around to me and said... Um, have a go at Frankie Lampard and uh, ask him how his haulage business is going oh, on. <laughs> and it had gone bust at the time. And Frankie Lampard gave me a, a right-hander on my eyeball. Did he? Oh! oh. He, were, he were told by one professional to go to him and ask how his private haulage business yeah. And you did? Yeah, I've got a black eye over it. And that was while I was carving a turkey. You did. It's all right, we're nearly at the end of the show. Apologies what if we couldn't get through. Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, of course, we could go before all these events to keep putting us off there, but apparently that doesn't occur to anyone. No, the people all right. want to hear that computer stuff. Exactly, yeah. Well, I'm sure it's you know, oh. a market, but, you know, we're going to... Oh, don't start us. We'll take it off yep. the air with us. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, I've been Danny Baker. I've been Danny Kelly. And here we can't... Well, I want to stay on the air, but we simply can't. Thanks a lot. We'll see you again sometime. See ya. Super Doms are going to come and get you. Tie up and look happy. Wow. Cool. <laughs> Where did that come in? Yeah. So, you don't need to know that. That's what I need to know. I was in this morning, did it. Uh, <laughs> Vinny, I've told you last week, I am under a pound and we are... Hang on, where's me, where's me thing going? Hang on, turn it up. I'm, I'm not mind fighting against Bud Sandingham for a minute. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you missed it a few weeks ago, I did bet Vinnie Jones that he, for like, some reason, I, what was it, Chelsea game, wasn't it? Yeah, he just rang in. I said, you won't win that. I said, I bet you 100 pounds. He said, for charity. I said, don't change your personality. Me and you. Mano a mano. Anyway, they went and won. And last week, I may have said, Jones, if you want your money, come and take it out on my chin. What? I said, yeah, come on, let's go. No you coward, you wretch. Still no sign of him. But yeah, you can call up. Show up. Let's go toe to toe. <laughs> I've got a terrible feeling this is going to end You're Danny Baker. And I'm Danny Kelly. <laughs> that's it, you're yep, Danny that's Kelly. That's it. I've just walked into the building, which is why I... Let's turn it off. What do you want to say, Kevin? Uh, I've got a lookalike for you. Go on. All right. Uh, David Platt. Yes. It looks like, a, you know, the Glenrick Pilchards. <laughs> yes, he does. The Glenric Pilchard. Yep. Yes, he does. Well, he, yep. he simply does. He has those eyes that can swivel independently of each and, other, doesn't he? And you can fa <laughs> you can fax this show, though we have never given out the number, and so someone has found it out and says, Emerson, the, the midfield player for uh, for Middlesbrough? Oh, yes. I know who you're going to say. Do you? I do know who you're well, going on, to say. Tell me who you think. Uh, I, we love to love her, baby, don't we? It's Donna Summer. <laughs> it's exactly who he looks like. <laughs> Emerson looks like Donna Summer. Oh, oh, right, this is just awesome. better and better. Yeah. And your ep when did you first realise Platt looked like the Glen Rick Pilchard? Oh, he's always had that sort of look about him, hasn't he? The bulging eyes and the lips. The lips and the bulging eyes, and yeah, that kind of. Uh, uh, I've never seen him in top hat and towels, which the Glen no, Rick Pilchard. Yeah, he is, yeah. Not. The Glen Rick Pilchard, you would, would don that. Uh, so, guard. presumably, at the Football of the Year show, he must, he, must, uh, dinner, he must look just the whole number <laughs> when he's got wow. all the, his, his dinner or so on. The Glen Rick Pilchard, sir, I've forgotten. And, uh, yeah. the one that, and I, I don't know what Glen Rick's figures are like these days, but I'm suggesting they're not as strong as yeah. they were when the Glen Rick Buy him out of McDonald's deal and get him on the television. That's a great one, the Glen Rick Pilchard. <laughs> Very good. I don't Kevin. want to do the rest of the show. They stopped me now, the Glen Rick Pilchard. <laughs> I want to hear the Glen Rick Pilchard, Rise and Shine, Glen Rick, <laughs> Pete, where are you, Pete? Oh, uh, Danny, I'm in Borsal Common. You have the misfortune to be on after the Glen Rick Pilchard call. That's so you've got to be any good. Uh, uh, well, I don't know. I love the story about David Platt, though. I'm sure he runs as if he's got fins on his head. Well, that's to say, I'm saying anyone seen anyone at the same time at the same place? Never yeah. been known, yeah. OK, what do you want to say? Anyway, the story is shouting, shouting things at footballers. Yeah. I'm in the civil service, so I've got privileged information as to Bob Wilson's middle name. You can be. always tell when you've got us, we don't babble yeah, all over no. you. Yeah, go on. <laughs> Standing on the North Bank years ago watching him play against Tottenham, I'm a Spurs fan, so mm -hmm. half time comes along, mm -hmm. puts his gloves in the back of the net and he just looks up to the crowd. Oi! Primrose! Whoa. Oh, from the blue on his face, it was... No! Seriously? Oh, no, sir. Yeah. No, but I'm thinking if somebody shouted now, and I suspect I'm going to get this heavy, oi, Primrose at me, I'd look round. Yeah. Yeah. You'd look round yeah, even more stunned if you knew you'd it. You'd spent the whole of your life name. hiding this middle name. But how do you know it is his middle name? 
Honestly, he says he's received a servant. He's found it in government computers, hasn't he? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've missed some parts of the story. No, no, you? I heard him say that, yeah. but I didn't know oh, whether... Well, he's made the connection, hasn't he? He's... Yeah, but... Uh, I don't know. You see, I'm, I, I, I'm, you're, you're buying H, L and S. I am. I'm calling for this. Nothing to do with being the Arsenal goalkeeper you want it to be Primrose. Yeah. I would be extremely surprised if Bob Wilson's middle name is Primrose. <laughs> this sounds to me like a, a story that started nicely, uh, and then he said, hey, do you know? He said, my mate works at a civil service. He looked it up. I, uh, we need some other evidence to call up. Once we do... You are a civil servant, yes? I am a civil servant, yeah. Yeah. All right. And you yourself have seen the computer screen that says I Robert have... Primrose Wilson. I have actually seen the document with his signature then, on it. Uh, I do you? not for a second. I raised my Glenric Pilcher style hat to you, <laughs> no question. <laughs> His middle name's Primrose? Honestly, no word of a lie. Well, well he, could get, he could get a musical act going with that. No, but I think this, is, this, this may be the end of it all. Because, yeah. you know, we have a... We'll be working on ITV television before the week is out. <laughs> I'm, you can't keep... You seriously cannot employ a man, I don't believe anyway, to present a, a network football show who has the Primrose middle name. No. You can't do that. Maybe he passed the name down. Yeah, we can, yes, we'll now. be going and seeking him out. He's got two options. He can come down and say, that's a proud family tradition, in which yeah. we can all say, sorry, Primrose, we meant no offence. <laughs> <laughs> or else, every time the ITV or, gentry is spotted, well, I'm saying, hordes of Primroses should come up to... Yeah. Primrose? Let <clears throat> Let me say it. Have you tried uh, looking at other footballers' names? Um, the only other interesting one, well, most of them are dead oh. boring. The only other interesting one was yes. Martin Chivers. <coughs> <coughs> yes, you fascinate us strangely. He's, he's pretty boring, but it's Harcourt. Harcourt? Harcourt. <laughs> How boring is that, you fool? <laughs> in the meantime, the rest of us out there wondering why our rent rebate hasn't come back <laughs> inside. <laughs> it's because they're all gathered around the old computer screen going, Harcourt? Oh, oh, Primrose? Oh. Oh, man. Wait, I don't you, care you've got to look up a lot more for us than that. We, need, sure we need a whole lot more next week. I don't sure care what action takes people. place this afternoon. I don't care what results roll in. I don't care if Man United get beat 11-0, which is a possibility. They've got to follow this show with the kind of information yeah. we've been giving out. Yeah. The, we said you had to follow Grenwick Pilchard. He did. He's top man. I'm going to include this one because although they are two human beings and both the same sex, one is a very much a fictional character. Think back to the 70s, the, the fall and rise of Reginald Perrin, the, the greatest TV comedy series perhaps on the TV ever. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we could perhaps. say that. <laughs> when, when he takes to the roads and puts the false teeth in when he becomes a tramp. Oh, yes, he does. Right, he comes he does. a tramp and puts the teeth in. I yes. give you England centre half Gareth Southgate. <laughs> oh, no, I don't actually. Simon Grant does from Bristol, uh, who wrote to us. Yes, you can write to us. The, when he becomes the pig farmer with the false teeth. <laughs> It is Gareth Southgate, Southgate to a T. Oh, <laughs> man. You know, if, if, if I had access to a... A, a, a nat- morphing a, machine. A, no, a na- national sports magazine, I would like to see some of these realised <laughs> editor of Total World. <laughs> Daddy, 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 Daddy. Daddy. Tie up and look happy. Oh, wow, Pat. Is that Vinnie Jones again? No, it's he's, just he's a, had some fun there, haven't we? Oh. What is that thing you showed me and jumped out your seat? Oh, no, 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 no. It's rarely, you know, we get, do get sent some terrible stuff here, and, I, and it's rarely it makes me go, oh, no. Yeah. Remember our friends Paul Town, who for most of last season didn't have a single solitary point no, to their name. No, they played something like 25, yeah. lost And 25. then they blew it by getting a point. Yeah. And you thought, we'll never speak of Paul Town again. Yeah. Now, they've blown it by being too good mm-hmm. by getting this point. Here's a letter from the South Sea... Bubble, I, I'm South Sea Advertiser, whatever this local newspaper is called, with the big roundup of their season. And uh, the top journalist, Mark Lawford, from this newspaper, reminds yep. us, yep. such is the club's plight, that their outstanding player, 15-year-old defender Ben Laundra, was unable to play against Tombridge in week, midweek because he could not afford to give up his paper round. Oh, no! Cool <laughs> town! <laughs> yes, it is. The club fly at the moment is so bad that 15-year-old defender Ben Launder was an unlucky player against Tunbridge in midweek because he could not afford to give up his paper round. <laughs> Fair do. And they, get, and they get their results the way, in the paper on. every week. Body swerve the conversation away from football for a second. Um, foot, uh, sportsmen who want to be noticed. Um, yesterday morning about half past nine, um, on the way to work, up London's busy Regent Street, the noise in the distance... <laughs> Ah, uh, hang on. I'm, I'm ahead of you here. You're not quite, because you may, you may be right, but if... Uh, whirm, whirm. Gradually, you know, the, the traffic comes. And then turning left into Oxford Street, where it is illegal to drive a private car, I might add, yeah. presumably on his way back from the big breakfast, Chris Eubank, yes, in, that, I'm ahead of you. in that gigantic American rig of his, but not just going, whirm, but he shouts, Eubank is here, Eubank is here, <laughs> into the street. 
You bankers here. You bankers here. And people... Now, now, you, you're British. Oh, you're British on a cold and frosty morning. We don't talk to each other much, do we? But people are making eye contact and going, good <laughs> God, he's saying, you bankers here. You bank oh, he's the best. He's absolutely he's the, the great S. He's the best. He's the oh. number one. He's a champion pip. He's oh, a uh, uh, footballers make an exhibition of themselves. Yeah. That, that door's always open. Don't wait for us to get in there. If you've uh, seen... Uh, man, if you've seen footballers turn up for signings of their ghost written books and nobody's there, <laughs> that could... <laughs> Unless they were standing on the table saying, Shilton here! Shilton here! New bank is here! <laughs> it's not going to beat that. What do you want to say, Michael? Peter Beard's Lisey's. Yeah, years ago. Here? Years ago, when he first came yeah, back yeah, to play for Newcastle. Crushed, I want to hear this. Yeah. He'd just come back to play for Newcastle, and it yeah. was in the middle of winter. He just moved into a nice wee house in a place called Hexham. If you're just joined us, we are asking, have you ever been in a footballer's house? Yeah, go on. And I'm working for, like, a job in builder. Yeah. Not a great lot of work done in the winter, of course, so we do television aerial rigging. Oh, yeah. So we go around to this Peter Beardsley's house, and I'm seeing in his television aerial, yeah. and there's a great big tree, and I think, well, in the summer, that's going to block his reception. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I was very confident in me working those sure. days. Yeah, come on, come change the So I goes, in, goes into his house, big, flush red carpet. Mm -hmm. He invites me in to see his uh, Christmas card from Kevin Keegan. <laughs> <laughs> he gets very excited about it. He, he didn't say, no, hang on, he didn't say, would you like to come in and see my Christmas card from he Kevin did. Keegan? He did. <laughs> did he? He did. <laughs> Uh, I've got a Christmas card you from Kevin Keegan. <laughs> you bank is here! I'm you wearing, a, I'm wearing a great big Leeds United scarf at the time. Well, give us what? I was wearing a great big Legion 8. It's got it wasn't a homemade Legion 8 cut. Don't tell us it was, it, it was it's even better. It was near enough. It, so you went in. Now, design. all I've got written down here so far is red carpet with the word red underlined, yeah? Oh, yeah, so I walked in, red carpet throughout, and I go in and get big work boots. Ah. And, like, Mrs. Beardsley suddenly turned up, who is a doll? She's absolutely beautiful. Oh, I know, no, he's got a, as I said, Famous um, the, the only unfortunate sight this story is it's Beardsley again, who everyone loves, everyone respects, yes. and did the greatest thing ever in the history of football when he ran off to his son after he scored that penalty. Yeah. However, that's not going to stop me saying, tell us all, tell us more. Go on. So it's like she comes down and Peter, Peter, and gives him this really, really sharp look and ushers me out with the hoose. <laughs> she goes down and told him off for asking the work, but I've brought him in, love, to see Kevin. <laughs> you've got to Christmas stop card. bringing strange men in the house to see your Christmas card, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Peter, but this is Beards. He said, I admit. It, Kevin didn't send you a card. I sent it to you to make him fit, make him feel good. <laughs> Stop bringing him bloat off the street to did, see the damn card. Did you actually ever get to see the card? I, I brought it out. Was it padded? No, no. What kind of card was it? Oh, it was a, um, you know, the sort of metallic-y coloured one. Yeah. yeah. It was one yeah. of those. It was a wee posh job. Well, at least it wasn't a photo of him and the family around the tree with oh, all the best from there. And, and it was, it, you, I don't suppose you took the liberty of examining the message, did you? Oh, certainly not. No. I, was, I wasn't oh. interested at all. Yeah. All oh, right. Oh, what did you say? The captain. Oh, yeah, we've got to do Andy. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'd like to... Uh, so so all, we know, wonderful. all we know is that Peter Bidzi has a red carpet and a wonderful but Gr fearsome wife who objects to strange men coming in, even if it is, to see the Christmas cards from Kevin, Kevin Keegan. Keegan. That's the kind of stuff we're after there. Only 15 minutes left. We must do Andy Darling. Now, is it in there, Andy Darling? Yeah, you're going to queue up. What's he talking about? Yeah, he's talking this week um, uh, about the, the, the last of the great showbiz managers. OK, 03459096693 in the meantime. Uh, please, uh, if it's having trouble getting through, I promise it will happen. We'll take as many as we can during this week's portion of Andy Darling. So it's farewell to Britain's last Fancy Dan managers. Terry Eltel Venables is off to a land down under. Jewelry-loving Ron Big Ron Atkinson, a man who's had his fingers in more sovereign rings than a royal doctor testing for enlarged prostates, is shunted upstairs at Highfield Road. In the days when life was a black-and-white film, football managers were stout types of a Captain Mannering stripe, and they were all called Herbert Chapman. The 50s and 60s then saw an influx of gruff, wiry-haired men in Max, the likes of Bill Nicholson, Joe Harvey... Bill Shankly, Harry Catrick, and Jimmy the Squirrel Cyril. By the late 60s, though, the times they were a-changing, and there was something in the air. From the expression permanently on Jimmy the Squirrel Cyril's face, it was a foul-smelling gas. As the song said, if you are going to Scarborough Fair, be sure to wear some flowers in your hair. And so the Withit football manager was born. There was sideboard at Malcolm Allison, regularly spotted with bunny girls, whose favourite bedtime activity clearly wasn't reading Warren Peace. There was Thomas Henderson Doherty, the doc, and Brian Clough, still occasionally called Brian Clough, by those who claim Frank Boff should be pronounced Frank Bow, and who get embarrassed watching the holiday programme when it's announced, and on tonight's show, Frank and Nesta Boff in France. And then the money men muscled in on the game. Flair wasn't enough. Winning was the sine qua non of the game. Along with AstroTurf, Fancy Dan managers were on the way out. 
Incidentally, playing on AstroTurf was never financially viable. The cost of going to the moon to play football was literally astronomical. The paradigm of future football managers is Arsene Wenger, a lean man, half scientist, half dietitian, and half mathematician. There's no champagne Charlie lifestyle for Wenger, and he has little time for jokers ringing his secretary and saying, Arsene around? No, it's grilled fish and grilled vegetables for the Arsenal boys now, rather than the blood sausages of the Herbert Chapman days. Yes, the lazy, crazy, hazy days of fancy Dan managers have gone, and thanks to fitness fanatic Wenger, soon the only six-pack you'll see a player with will be his chiselled abdominal muscles. Rap fans, incidentally, prefer a two-pack, though he's dead in it. Do that, that letter. Yeah. The, the this, is a le this is a letter about playing for the other team. Um, it's complex, but, but it, it's, wor it's worth bearing with me. This is from um, Dougie Brimson, who some of you may have know, wrote that book about, uh, what, about football fans called Everywhere We Go. But it's, it's, uh, Shall it I has, down for this it one, has some mark of a true story about it. Because it starts with the words, during my time in the Royal Air Force. Mm. So immediately you've got some carry-on music playing in the background. <laughs> um, I, was the manager, I was the manager of the squadron team. We were rooted firmly to the bottom of our Sunday league. We had not got a point all season. Yep. I dropped myself from the defence one afternoon mm -hmm. because... Frankly, I was not helping, blah, blah, blah. Match day arrives, the other team turn up, they are top of the league, mm. they have won every single one of their games, they turn up with ten men. I volunteer to play for them, saying, I'm substitute for my team, you've only got ten, I volunteer to play. Yeah. They say, nah, we don't need you, we're perfectly perfect. I can't understand that. No that's problem. Cool. Yeah, that's all right. Game I'm goes on it. for half an hour, their goalkeeper gets injured. They're now down to nine men, they haven't got a goalkeeper. He's, Dougie volunteers again, I will go in goal. Um... Uh, having promised them, I will be totally impartial. I'll read the letter verbatim from here on in. So, following various warnings from their captain, and bearing in mind that, we only, that they'd only threatened their goal once in the whole first half, which is where the goalkeeper got injured, they reluctantly accepted my offer, and I took my place in goal against my own team. Now, such was the lack of skill exhibited by my own side, I had nothing to do, but they, the team I was now in goal for, could still not score, and it looked as though we, my real side, would get our point, the yep. first one this yep. season. Suddenly, huge punt forward, he comes out, they break their, 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 their defenders, break, bring one of the forwards down, it's a penalty. So he's now facing Basically a penalty, a penalty yep. uh, from his own team. Uh, blah, 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 blah. He starts moving his eyes to the left to show his own centre forward <laughs> where he is going to dive. Right? Oh, I see. And and I'm, I'm yeah. ahead of this, yes. I think. Yeah. The centre forward thinks... Interprets this uh, as... Yeah, I must put the ball over this side. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'd think. Yeah. I'd There's think that. He's telling me where to put it, not where I'm centre going. Centre forward strikes perfect shot to, the right, to, the, to his right. Goalkeeper dives to the left. They connect. Wow. No goal. It gets worse. In, the ball is then cleared out the penalty area in the last few minutes, and the other team do score the winner directly from his save in the penalty. Imagine the row afterwards. I told you, I was going to put it, it, your eyes. It put just, your eyes. Just the word nightmare at the end. That just is a, a great one. Nightmare. Facing a penalty against you. See, I would. I mean, I don't know about yeah, that, but me. seriously, if you and I were, no matter what we'd been through in the rest of the season, uh, uh, let's call our Sunday team um, the Burning Spearites, right? Yeah. If you want to improve on that, fine. But yeah. at the moment, I think there's just some common ground there. So, uh, And if it was the last game, the last match of the season and we were playing a game we needed to win and I was in goal face I would have to save your penalty just for the yeah, lifelong yes, crack it would give us absolutely you've got to save yep. your friend's penalty yep. so any, anything you can give those camaraderie and stories. of course uh, it's, it's true Baker and Kelly up front story because not only did he save the penalty but the other team from, from it yes yes you've got to up the stakes all yes. the way around quarter yep. to one I always tell a story here because from the male point of view and I told you about I loved this a friend of mine Steve Sheard who uh, was we were in the cup it was the year we worked to the quarterfinals and got knocked out at Luton but we were pacing it out, and we said, well, you know, where's the FA Cup? It's on, oh, it's May the 3rd this year, whatever it was. Yeah. His birth baby was due May the 2nd, right? Oh. And so, but it looked, we were two games away from Wembley. Wembley was a good side, you know, and we were two games away from it. And we, I remember this, and this is a genuine ad lib, and you don't hear a lot of genuine wit on terraces. So he said, Steve, and he said, I know what you're going to say. He said, well, look, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? He said, well, if it's a cup final, of course, he said, um... Uh, it's a cup final. I don't think it's a pro. He said in the end, he, uh, he said, you know, I love it and all that. But nevertheless, uh, in a cup final, what I'll do is I'll just have to, uh, uh, that, uh, well, yeah, all right, I'll tape it. That's what I'll do. And then when I come back from the football, she can show me what happened. <laughs> <laughs> he, he actually said that, Steve. Yeah, he did. He said, I'll tape it. When I come back from the football, she can show me what happened. Dave, uh, it's quarter to two. What do you want to tell us, Dave? Uh, we opened up at Turnstile at uh, Forest Ground and we were Plymouth supporters. You what? <coughs> we opened up a turnstile yes. at Forest Ground yes. and we're Plymouth supporters. Yeah, in case I yesed all over that, uh, these are Plymouth supporters and we're going to hear about the day they opened up a turnstile at Manchester City. This is free enterprise. This is, is a white forest. forest. Not in Forest. Yeah. Not in Forest. Okay, yeah. how did this happen, leaving out no detail, no matter how small? Go on. Right, well, first of all, it took seven of us uh, nearly 20 hours to get to Nottingham via 
from St Ives in Cornwall via Newquay via Wimborne yeah. and me falling asleep at the wheel of course and yeah. one in the boot which surprised everybody at all the uh, transport cars but they we got in you there you somebody in your boot? Yeah we had to keep, keep changing because there were seven of us so it wasn't Taking legal so we kept boot. changing yeah. every 50 oh, miles yeah. put somebody different in the boot 50 miles? I'm saying good fellas here I don't yeah. know why but I'm saying if you'd have gone anywhere near Twerton Park they would have confiscated him yep. You can't take people in the boots of cars no you can get him back out of the game sir So there you are you're on your way to uh, Forest and Yeah well we get to Forest successfully and we all queue up at the opposite end to the trend end obviously for the way supporters yeah another turnstiles are open and it's only about eight turnstiles anyway and then eventually they t they turn up and they open up because there's about two thousand of us outside yeah and uh, they only ma manned half the turnstiles so first of all a friend and i thought we'll just pull open the door to let a few in free but yeah. people started offering us money so no. we stood there for about 10 minutes Raised about 50 quid. Any time nobody had the right money, we let, just pushed them in. Let me just say, sir, we're double underlying this. We are in yeah. no way condoning people opening up turnstiles and charging Pocketing admission to get into no. football grounds other than your own. There are very strict laws about this sort of yeah. thing. However, we don't want we, Graham Kelly on this, the phone. You know, in this, uh, this veil of tears we walk for these 60 or 70 years we're around, it does sometimes happen that there you are outside an opposing football ground and a turnstile is there and people start offering you money, as happened to our very good friend here. How much do you think you made? We made about £50 before we did a runner and put hat. So the stewards couldn't find us. You put, that will always confuse the stewards. We hats. needed it anyway because we had to leave at half time because we got bricked and the car broke down. Uh, so we needed to buy a new coil, so it was a good job we opened the turnstile. <laughs> <laughs> so you opened a turnstile on opposing ground. Meanwhile, over in Columbia on shortwave radio, Pablo Escobar is writing all this down. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Wheat of Vixen opening. That is a fantastic story. I've never Very heard good. Of that. Were you actually behind the ramp in the turnstile or just standing there? No, we, we actually got behind. We actually got in the right position you because you could just stand there. So, well, didn't it, then any wretches come in and just give you tickets? You wouldn't have wanted that, would you? No, because no, well, it was for the away supporters. It was before the days of all ticket cash match. Only, it was open cash game of 75, the season that Clough took over. Wow. I mean, that is a fantastic story. Yep. Opened up an entire independent turnstiles. So now it says uh, at home supporters, away supporters, independent turnstile. Every yeah. ground should have an independent turnstile because, let's face it, most turnstiles this, in this country are bent. That's a fact. I don't care yeah. if you, in these days of going through Ticketron and all that, there isn't a person, well, maybe two or three persons, maybe usually women, and, you know, fair enough, usually women are straight, but there isn't a turnstile, I don't believe, that can't be bought. And uh, it is our quest, it is our, our, our purpose in life on this show to find the most bent turnstile in the football so, league. to start this off, if you've ever paid less than the going rate to get in for the turnstile, so I'll just slip the guy five instead of seven. We've got to hear the lowest amount of money anyone's paid to legitimately I, I, get into a football I'm not going to tell the truth in case my little thing gets busted up because of this. But anyway, uh, Dave, where are you, Dave? Hello, Danny. Hiya, Dave. Hi, I'm in Southall, West London. In Southall. What do you want to tell us, my friend? It's another turnstile. It's another turnstile. Go on. It's another turnstile story. Wow. Good. Yeah. Um, I spent a, a few months, about ten years ago, Yeah. Working on the turnstiles at Mansfield. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, I think I'm responsible for one of the uh, lowest <laughs> admission prices. You see, oh. again, this is, uh, you can hear this fellow is not a lunatic. It's no. just, it's only human nature after it's only football and there is money involved. What can I tell you? Yeah, yeah, go on. The clubs well, are only going to waste it anyway. Sure That's they the are. Point. Mansfield, for God's sake. Yeah, go on. <laughs> what happened? Well, it was a Boxing Day match, Mansfield Chesterfield, mm. and a mate of mine turned up with his two young sons. Yeah. And I let, all three oh. of, I let all three of them in. On payment of a satsuma. A satsuma, <laughs> sir! And that is the most peculiar... See, the barter system, I don't know why yeah. it ever fell into disrepair. I agree, I agree entirely. Go on, give us the conversation. So, what? Uh, just invent a name for him. What should we call him? Uh, we'll call him John, shall we? OK, and we'll call you Dave. And I, will yeah, go, I go, and I go, hello, Dave, how's it going? That's it, yeah. He's Christmas, goes, mate. Oh, and he right. says, here you are, there's, that's for you. Yeah, a turn and satsuma. Said, Through you go. Through you go. Carrying, and, carrying his two young sons. Superb story. A satsuma to two Nottinghamshire men. turns style stories in succession. It sounds like a BBC Two play, doesn't it? A Satsuma for Mansfield. It sounds almost poignant. <laughs> yeah. uh, when was this, by the way? Oh, this would be about 84, something yeah. like that. Well, you see, I'm not aware whether, whether Satsumas is the normal currency in affairs like this. I don't know whether all football clubs will take Satsumas or to get Clementines. you in. I don't know. Or no, whatever. I don't I think know. they've graduated to Clementines well, Exactly. Now. I don't know if fruit is the yeah. way forward. But all I know is we have one of the most constant gates in the football league, Millwall.